that's sort of my my argument with why I am closer to being a copyright abolitionist than I am to. <laughs> no, I mean, look, the, and, and, and to keep this in mind, remember, copyright is only for 95 years, different if you're a contractor, you know, but it's only for a short period of time. And we even see, what was it, 1920s Pooh Bear? Yeah. You know, when went into the public domain, that expired, Disney was fighting, trying to get extensions and all the stuff. And, and, you know, it eventually does become free reign for everyone. Yeah. And so the idea is just to, you know, encourage creativity and that authors can protect their stuff. And, and where I would challenge you just a little bit is to say, well, you know, is it just because there's, there's so much piracy and it's too hard to police specifically with music. <clears throat> Therefore the, the range should just open, whatever. What about other types of content, right? So Joe Rogan's, you know, podcast. Yeah. What about long form content? What about your documentaries? What mm -hmm. about online courses? Is it the same kind of idea? You know, you you spend months of your life creating something, and if I want, I can go and sell it. When it comes to selling it, and that's sort of the the issue that most. I mean, I I've been obviously if somebody's selling my content for for a fee, like uh, there was some content on Nebula, for example, that uh, was I don't know, I guess just sort of word for word using oh, yeah. my content, you know. And I had a problem with that. I I actually don't have a problem if somebody's like more or less copying my videos on YouTube, but on Nebula, they're charging a subscription. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's not cool at all. Uh, another thing that drives me crazy is when I look at my YouTube metrics, Google Classrooms and universities are often a, a reasonably large chunk of the viewers in my videos. And I'm like, well, so people are paying a tuition to watch my videos that are free, that are freely available for everybody else. And they still have to watch the ads and everything else. But like, so there's just this middleman in there, you know, that I don't know if that's causing me losses. I don't think it is, but it is. It's still causing me a financial gain. You know, one of my favorite, one of my, th this is related, I swear. So let's pretend that we're in a casino and we're hanging out in a casino and we're next to a roulette table and I give you, I don't know, 200 bucks. I'm like, it, for some reason, I'm like, here, you have to gamble this. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a great night. And so, I don't know, what's your lucky number? What, lucky what, number what? 13. Okay, perfect. <laughs> the unlucky one. That's yeah. That was my lucky number as a kid for some reason as well. And I was like, yeah. I was like, wait, that's not good. Anyway, all right. So, you put on 13. Uh, I put $100 on 13. The wheel rolls. The ball lands on 36. How mad are you on the scale from 1 to 10 that it didn't land on 13? Not. So, what would it be? 1? Yeah, 1. Okay. So I have an expectation I was actually going to get anything, but I'm terrible at getting yeah. <laughs> so, so I, so I, so I tap you on the shoulder and I'm like, Hey, do you want to, do you want to grab a drink from the waitress while she's over here? You know, whatever it is. And when that happens, the roulette wheel rolls, and then you didn't bet on it and it lands on 13. How mad are you now from one really to 10? Mad. Really right. mad. Really mad. So you're, <laughs> you're, you're way more mad when you didn't lose anything than you were when you lost a hundred dollars. Yeah, totally. That's the, the sunk cost fallacy and all of our brains deal with it. And when we think it comes into play with copyright a lot, people, artists get really angry. He took my idea and he made money on it. This, I hear that all the time from, from musicians turning against one another in that way. And I always have to just say, how much did you lose? Did you lose sales off this? If you if you went to court, could you prove damages? Like actual damages, not they made money off of my idea, but like I lost money because of this, because that's actually a whole different thing. And it's actually very difficult to do. And it's a lot easier to be a musician if you think about it that way, rather than thinking about what somebody got that you didn't, even if it's your idea, because ideas only cost money because our government says they do, right? Like. Anybody can can circumvent that if if they try hard enough, and they always will. It, I think, it's not to get like too absurd and, and philosophical, but like I think that's made it easier for me to not be miserable <laughs> as as somebody who creates things. A music attorney is your number one legal resource for artists, producers, and record labels. Get contract templates, one-on-one -on -one legal advice, free master classes, and everything you need for your music business. Go to tommusicattorney.com.
And one thing I'll say that that I like about what you're <clears throat> offering is that, you know, we could have exceptions, right? Because the, the, the way copyright law is right now, it's so old. It doesn't match with how we actually, you know, even use technology, share information, all that. So then there was the Music Modernization Act of 2018, which kind of caught up a little bit. It's dealing with takedowns so that there's ways to deal with copyright infringement, all that. So they tried to catch up a little bit. But it doesn't apply still. And the best example is with um, doing cover songs. We'll go back to that. Yeah. So, you know, if I if I cover, you know, good luck out there and and I put up my version, I'm, I'm OK to do that under the Copyright Act. If I have my yeah. just audio version, there's a mechanical license that happens right away. DSPs cover it. But if I go and do a music video to my version, that's synchronization. And I have right. to go and actually go, you know, get a license from you. Now, I'm you know, I might be able to reach out to you, but if you're, you know, Lady Gaga, and even you, like maybe someone can't reach out to you. They can't. Yeah. So for all those reasons, practically speaking, all these people who do cover songs and put it on YouTube typically don't have a sync license. Okay. So they are committing copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. So what labels have done is they've gone and negotiated direct licenses with YouTube so that they go and they attach mm -hmm. to your song, they monetize your video so they can make money. So they're not striking your videos anymore, and it's really just an exchange of money. So regardless of the state of copyright law, there's this whole other thing that's actually happening. And so I think that's kind of the point you're getting to. You're like, this is what it is, but I think that, you know what, there's a better way to do this. Now, it's not a free-for-all, right? So I'm, you know, I'm right. coming out with my with my compilation of all of your documentaries, and I'm selling it for 10 grand and all this stuff. Like, you probably are going to want to sue me, and you probably do want to yeah. have some rights. But I think you're saying that there's something a little different happening with music. I think when it becomes problematic and when it does cost me money and when it does cost society something, even if I only stick to my own format, my own platform, YouTube does not recognize and they don't have the capability of recognizing fair use in any way. They just it's it's a can of worms that they're not going to open up because they don't have to right now. Nobody's forcing them to do it. They don't have to hire people to interpret videos when they claim fair use. They just say, no, fair use doesn't exist pretty much anywhere. So if I were to say, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about Modell melodies and harmonies and jazz. Let's, let's listen to giant steps or my favorite things, or, you know, that these, these Coltrane things that, that are really important, cultural, important for music that like huge things, I can't, I cannot give a demo of them on my YouTube channel because I will then, even though it's fair use, even though I'm referring to it from an educational standpoint, no court in the world would not see it as fair use, right. but it's just not allowed on that platform. And therefore the, you know, but however many people would be watching that video, don't get to learn about that. And they, I can't share it with them. And that, in my opinion, actually hurts culture quite a bit. I think that that's actually... I, I think it can be tragic because you think about how it can actually erase things that are really important. It's not my fight, but but it is a huge bummer because there's been so many things that I've just not been able to talk about because I can't give a demo. I've even given I've even like referred to things and then just to be an asshole played library music of something ridiculous and then been like, sorry, I can't actually play the song here. But so I put in some tropical house instead. No, I just, I just, you know, I'm like, this is going to delay this thing by like a week. I have, you know, the lawyer language and 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 that helps because we have kind of templated fairly fair use language that we can send to mm -hmm. help overcome because you're citing to actual cases and all the stuff, but it's usually yeah. a non-lawyer looking at this. So there's no guarantee. So you put in the effort to create the educational content or the reaction to something and, you know, and then obviously you can't move as quickly as you want. You can't be as efficient of a business as you want to be if you're trying to like move on something that just came out you know and so yeah i have to make that decision as well being like the music lawyer that wants to be like hey you know let's compare these songs yeah and, and i mean most of my peers on youtube are absolutely they hate reaction content they hate it when their videos are are in a react and i cannot for the life of me understand why it's like, I don't watch it, but it brings me more viewers. Like, it's not like it's helping me. It's helping my growth because somebody else is literally dedicating their platform to reacting to my video. Even if they're being rude, it doesn't matter. Like, it's, Love I just that. don't see it. Yeah.